Go ahead and open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. It would be found on page 1520, page 1520 in the church Bibles here, Matthew chapter 13. And as you are uh, turning to it, uh, I want to talk to you about uh, heart transplant. Heart transplant. Matthew 13, page 1520. I don't know if you're aware, but there's basically uh, two types of uh, heart transplants. One is what uh, is called as the orthotopic transplant, and the other one is the heterotopic. What we're familiar with, for the most part, is the orthotopic, where the failing heart of the patient is removed, and a new heart is put in place. Uh, the other one, which is lesser known, is the heterotopic transplant. In this, uh, the surgeon actually leaves the old heart, but puts the new heart and connects the new heart to the old heart. So why do they do that? Two reasons. One, sometimes the old heart can get strength because of the new heart and then you can remove the new heart out. It gets healed. The other times, the second reason is for this. If the new heart, the body is rejecting the new heart, it can be removed and the body can still function at the old heart without immediate risk. Now when it comes to the heart transplant that uh, Jesus performs, many of us would like the second operation. You want to keep the old one, fit the new one in. We just want enough of Christianity to help us get better. We want self-improvement, not a new self. But our sin-filled hearts cannot get any better. The Bible describes the heart with which we are born as a dead heart. It is dead to God's desires. It is dead to God's commands. They're not just sick, they're dead. We love a contingency plan in case Jesus shocks the system. Our thinking is this, if following Jesus does not work, I can go back to my old life the way it was. In other words, we want an exit strategy. We always want a plan B. But Jesus performs only one kind of a heart transplant. He removes the old, lifeless, callous heart and inserts a new one that beats to the pulse of his Holy Spirit. And only when our hearts beat to the pulse of the Holy Spirit, we can live forever. Only then we will desire a brand new life, a godly life, one that bears fruit for his glory. And that's the kind of heart Jesus offers to each of us as we work our way to the very first parable in Matthew chapter 13. The entire parable is from verses 1 through 23. But last week, for those of you who were here, we saw that. Remember, we, we saw verses 1 through the first part of verse 3 and verses 10 through 17. We looked at the basic ideas of how to interpret parables. Because right in this chapter, Jesus gives us seven parables. If we don't understand the fundamentals of interpreting parables, then there's no point in trying to work our way through the parable. So that's why I took a, uh, took a message to dedicate to how to interpret the parables. We're not gonna go back and rehash that. Uh, but today we're gonna look at the actual parable itself. It's listed, I'm gonna read from verses three through nine, where Jesus gives the parable, and then verses 18 through 23, where Jesus himself explains this parable for us. So let's pick up from verse three. Then he, that is Jesus, told them many things in parables. And here's the first one. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. And then come over to verse 18. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, 
the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty or thirty times what was sown. Keep your fingers there and then turn over to the next book of the Bible, Mark and Mark chapter 4. I just want to read one couple of verses from that, actually one verse from that and then we're going to come back to this. And that's page number 1561. 1561. Don't lose your place in Matthew. We're going to come back to that. Because Mark and Luke, by the way, give their account of this parable also. This is the only parable, by the way, that Matthew, Mark, and Luke uh, record in their Gospels. John does not have any parables, as I said last week. In Mark chapter 4 and verse 13, Mark records Jesus' words where he stresses the importance of understanding this parable. Look at verse 13. Jesus says, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? So what Jesus is saying is this, it is very critical for us to understand this parable. And that's why Jesus said, back to Matthew 13 and in verse 9, whoever has ears, let them hear. That has the idea of pay close attention. This is serious stuff, pay close attention. Now the parable itself deals with a farming illustration that would have been very familiar to the people of Jesus' day. The farmer goes out, you know, he throws his seed and the seed falls in four different kinds of soils. Unlike today where you plow the ground first and then you plant the seed, those days they would throw the seeds and then plow the ground. And of the four grounds that are mentioned here, only one ground, only one soil yielded, yielded what the farmer expected it to yield. In fact, it yielded much more than what the farmer expected. That's the parable of verses 3 through 9. But then in verses 18 through 23, Jesus says there's something beyond just the story. Remember what a parable is. It's a short story or a saying that points to a spiritual truth or multiple spiritual truths. The story is this. It's a real life incident. This is how the farmer does. But then Jesus wants us to draw some spiritual truths from there. Basically each of the soil, Jesus says, represented the various heart conditions of the people who received the gospel message. The message about Jesus being the savior Jesus being the king appointed by God to come and set up God's kingdom. And only one type of a heart responded positively to that message. That's the, uh, that's the heart that's pictured by the seed on the good soil. And by giving us this parable, what Jesus is doing is this. He is forcing us to examine ourselves to see what kind of a heart each of us has. And that's why I've titled this morning's sermon as Know Your Own Heart. Know Your Own Heart. We must search our own hearts or even better, ask the Holy Spirit to search our hearts to reveal to us our true heart condition. True heart condition. Because we can be deceived. We are so biased for ourselves. We will only see the right things that we want to see from our heart condition. But we want to know how God sees our heart. So we need to know our heart condition. And if it is not the heart that is acceptable to Jesus, I pray that we will all seek in humility, ask him to give us that kind of a heart that bears fruit. Let's pray. Father, I pray that by the time we leave today, all of us will have the kind of heart that is acceptable to Jesus. The heart that responds positively to the gospel message and bears fruit fruit. Do it for his sake. We, we ask this in his name. Amen. Amen. Let's pick up the parable. Uh, first of all, a farmer went out to sow his seed. Typically farmers of that day, what they would do, 
they would carry a small bag or multiple small bags they'd sling it across their shoulder and as they walk they grab a handful and keep scattering them the farmer in this picture first and foremost refers to Jesus Christ and by extension to all Christians who go out and share the gospel the seed points to the gospel the gospel of the kingdom the kingdom that Jesus is setting and the soil or the ground that's referred by the path rocky places among thorns or the good soil all represent the heart condition just like the soil the seed fall on different grounds the message falls on different kinds of heart conditions it's the third one that Jesus focuses on here that, that, that the ground that's the main character that he focuses on the different kinds of characters and then he helps us understand the different grounds by portraying four kinds of hearts four kinds of hearts are revealed in this parable so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a particular seed uh, the, the seed that fell on a particular soil and connect that to what kind of a heart it points to so I'm going to rearrange the verses a little bit as we go through this hopefully that will help us better uh, understand this parable let's look at the first soil that's the seed that was sown on the path and the heart it represents let's call it hard heart Heart number one that Jesus portrays here is the hard heart. Look at verse four. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. What does he mean by the path? And some of us who come from uh, uh, other places might be a little more familiar. I, I, I know when I used to go visit some of my family members who are not living in the city, farms usually, you know, you would have like a little path cut between the farms or on the side. It's for people to travel from one side of the farm to another side. That was a path that would be frequent with many travelers, which means the path would be hard. It would be solid ground. So when the sower throws the seed there, it's not going to penetrate, and the birds come and quickly devour them. Jesus explains a spiritual truth this soil points to. Look at verses 18 and 19. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away. That's Satan and his demons pictured by the birds. They snatch away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. This is a picture of people who are hard in their hearts. Immediate context, it refers to the Pharisees because they heard the message over and over and they still were resolved in their heart to oppose Jesus. There are people like that even today. They're hard in their hearts. They don't, they cannot understand the message because they don't want to understand. In their heart, they don't want anything to do with Jesus, even though they've been exposed to the truth time and time again. These are people so deep in sin, they've completely shut off their consciences. They refuse to see their sin and refuse to see the need for a savior. They may hear the message, but by the time they go to the parking lot, they've forgotten what they've heard. That's because they don't want the message. And just like the birds came and devoured the seed, Satan and his forces come and immediately blind them even more. Is this your kind of a heart. Is your heart, this heart, hard heart, totally hard, totally indifferent to the message about the kingdom of heaven? Does Jesus the King move you at all on the inside to respond to him? If not, if it doesn't move you at all, then let me tell you this. You are in a very dangerous place, very dangerous place. Turn before it gets too late. Today, this morning, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. Don't put off the decision of turning to Jesus. Don't put it off. Don't be like the old man I read about who on his deathbed, his friend invited a pastor to come and visit this old dying man. When the pastor came, this dying man said these words to the pastor. When I was 17, I began at times to feel deeply about setting my soul right with God. And this continued for two to three years. But I determined to put it off 
until I was settled in life and made my money. After I was married, I reflected that the time had come when I had promised to attend to religion. But by then I had bought a farm and I thought it would not be convenient for me to become religious until it was paid for since attending church would take time and money. I then resolved to put it off for another 10 years. But when the 10 years were completed, I thought no more about it. I sometimes try to think about it, but I cannot keep my mind on the subject one moment. The pastor begged him not to face death as an enemy of God, but to repent. But the old man with tears said this, it's too late. I believe my doom is sealed and that is just as it should be for the Holy Spirit battled with me many a time, but I refused. You see, light repeatedly rejected ends up with light permanently withdrawn. Today you resist the Holy Spirit. It becomes easier to resist tomorrow. It becomes even more easier to resist day after tomorrow. But then the day will come when the Holy Spirit will just pull back and say, I'm not even going to speak to your conscience anymore. Because you have settled in your hardness of heart. That's why the Bible says, today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Today, in fact, I would add to that saying, this morning, this morning, if you hear his voice, don't continue to remain in that hardened heart. Just from where you are, even in the midst of this sermon, you can say, Jesus, save me. That's it. Save me. Deliver me from me. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Jesus will remove that hard heart and give you a new heart, a heart that will yield to him completely. Let's look at the second soil. A soil that's pictured by the seed sown on rocky places and the heart it represented. Let's call it the shallow heart. Heart number one, hard heart. Heart number two, the shallow heart. Notice verse five and six, what did they say? Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Now obviously it's not seed that is directly thrown on rocky places. Typically what Jesus refers to as rocky places has about two to three inches of soil. Underneath would be hard limestone rock and that's the bedrock there. So what happens when the seed gets sown? Because of the warmth of the sun, they germinate quickly. But then the roots cannot go in because there's hard rock underneath. So when the temperature gets much higher, no moisture, that plant is going to die. Jesus explains the spiritual truth this teaches, verses 20 and 21. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they only they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, that's the key. It's not talking about natural uh, troubles that follows everyone. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. They hear the message. These are the people that hear the message. They immediately get excited and respond out of pure emotion. At once, immediately, says they receive it with joy. But they never experienced the conviction of the Holy Spirit. They never saw themselves as sinners. They never really counted the cost of following Jesus. Just purely emotional response, like the kind of response you get in a large gospel meeting, in a hyped up rally. But when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, and it will come, it will come. They quickly fall away. Literally, they're offended because Jesus now calls them to do something that they don't want to do. They're ashamed. In other words, they have no problem in following Jesus as long as it is convenient for them and as long as there is no cost to pay. But when there is a price to pay, they're gone in a flash. Just as they showed immediate joy when they heard the gospel, at once receives it with joy, 
they now show immediate rejection. They quickly fall away. A life purely built on emotions alone, rather than stopping and thinking that suffering for Jesus is worth every bit, they end up denying him by their actions. Or well, maybe not by their mouths so much, but by their actions. They may still say, oh, I love Jesus, I'm a Christian. But there's no actions to back it up. Is your heart this kind of a heart? Maybe it's not a hard heart, but it's a shallow heart. Superficial. You may even be attending church, telling everyone you're a Christian. But deep inside, deep inside, you know you are rebellious. You obey only as long as it's convenient. But when it costs you something, you take the path of least resistance. Take the easy path. If so, you too must yield to the Holy Spirit's convicting work in your heart today. Because the Holy Spirit is speaking to you today, right now. You too must remember today is the day of salvation. Today if you hear his voice, don't remain in this shallow condition. Ask Jesus to show you mercy. No more shallowness, no more superficiality, no more pretending to be a Christian. Who are you fooling? At the end of the day you're fooling yourself. Ask Jesus to give you a new heart this morning. Same cry from where you are. Lord, give me a new heart. Lord, give me a new heart. No matter how much you messed up, that's the beauty of this good news about Jesus. No matter how far you are, no matter how much you have sinned, Jesus is just a call away. <coughs> give me a heart that yields to you, Lord. That's the cry. On to the third soil. That's pictured by the seed that fell among the thorns and the heart it represented. Let's call it the crowded heart. Hard heart, shallow heart. Let's call this the crowded heart. Hope you see why I call it that way. Look at verse seven. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Now obviously, a, a farmer, a seed is a precious thing. A farmer was not gonna just throw seed where he sees a thorn bush. Typically what they would do is, they would cut the thorn bush out and they would burn up the uh, surface level but the roots underneath, they might not always take it out. So here's the seed that's falling on that. The ground looks good, but underneath, there's still those roots are there. So when the, that ground gets water, the thorn bushes start coming up. And they grow more faster and more aggressively than the regular plants. And guess what? As a result of that, they choke it. They, they choke the plant from producing any grain. Jesus explains the spiritual truth that teaches. Look at verse 22. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, like the water that that seed would get. The ground gets the seed, the ground also gets the water. So they hear the word, repeatedly hearing. But the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. There's no fruit here. This is not talking about loss of rewards. This is talking about no fruit. No fruit. It's a picture of the individual whose heart is crowded with competing interests. They want to follow Christ, that's on the one side of the heart. But then worldly interests are lined up right next to that on the other side of the heart. Jesus names actually three competing interests. Matthew lists two, and we're going to look at Mark who lists the third one. Look at the first two that Matthew lists here. First competing force is the worries of this life. This is the heart that is unnecessarily preoccupied with the temporary issues of this life. What to eat, what to drink, what to wear. I mean, obviously, Jesus is not saying you should not be concerned about that. Earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, I provide. But here, it refers to a heart that is consistently thinking about this. I mean, when you think about people's lifestyle today, those who profess to be Christians, they're busy going shopping, coming back home, going back returning, coming back home. What food to eat? What diet plan to follow? This is all that consumes them. It's not about, you know, what to wear. It's not about how to take care of your health. This is not forbidding that. This is about the preoccupation of, that's what Jesus says, the worries of this earthly life. And then he adds a second one, deceitfulness of wealth. This is the heart 
that puts its trust in money that always promises to satisfy, but never ever keeps its promises. Those who trust in their riches will fall, but the righteous will thrive like a green leaf. Solomon wisely warns us. Proverbs 11, verse 28. Ecclesiastes again, Solomon tells us, you want, the one who wants more money is never going to have enough. Ecclesiastes 5, verses 9 through 10. Never enough. So it chokes them. Here's two competing interests. But then Mark gives us a third one. So again, keep your finger in Matthew. Go to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, verses 18 through 19. In case you need the page number again, it's page 1561. 1561. Notice what Jesus says. Let me pick it up from verse 18 on. It says, Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word. He lists all three here. But the worries of this life, we already saw that. The deceitfulness of wealth, we saw that. And the third one, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Just in case the first two didn't address, Mark records Jesus giving the third competing interest. Everything else that is not from God. Everything else that's against God's interest. That's what's covered by that phrase, desires for other things. It's an all-encompassing phrase. covers everything. That's a third competing interest that makes that heart unfruitful. That word desires is sometimes translated in other contexts as lust. It literally craves. This is the heart that in addition to craving for the basic necessities of life and craving for money, it gives them to all kinds of pleasures that's otherwise unprofitable and many times outright wicked. This is what Paul calls in Galatians 5 verse 19 through 21 as acts of the flesh. And he names them sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. If I were to put it in plain terms, you know what's the goal of the crowded heart? What's the goal of the crowded heart? Enjoy everything to the max that this world has to offer. Drink it up. I want heaven, Jesus here, but I also want to have the best this world has to offer. And if I cannot get it, I'll keep on wanting it. That's the goal of the crowded heart. I'm smart. I can somehow fit Jesus in the midst of all my other pursuits. That's the deceitfulness The mind deceives, sin deceives. Hebrews 3.13 says, don't be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Sin will deceive us into thinking you can have everything the world has to offer plus cherry on the top, Jesus. And the ultimate result, no fruit, indicating no genuine salvation. I tell you, if there's one group that concerns me the most in the church today, it's this group that falls in the crowded heart category. Why? Because they say the right things most of the times. They even outwardly do a lot of right things. But there's always the dominant characteristic of worldliness present. Their actions give proof of that no matter how much they pretend to be Christians. And you're always left wondering, are they the real deal? Or are they deceiving others and deceiving themselves? Because God is not deceived. God knows. You see, worldly, worldliness and godliness cannot flourish at the same time. Thorns and good plant cannot flourish at the same time. Weeds and grass cannot flourish at the same time. Eventually, what takes over? The weeds, not the grass. You notice that? So the weeds have to be removed from the root up. We cannot do it on our own. We need to ask Jesus to do it. That is why, if you see yourself in this category, you need to ask Jesus to give you a new heart. Again, the same thing applies today if you hear his voice. Today if you hear his voice, ask him to remove all these competing interests, to give you a heart that focuses on Jesus. Now we understand even as Christians, we struggle with a lot of these things. 
there's a difference between struggling, acknowledging that struggle, and going to him versus denying it. The coward heart denies it. It lives in deception. Or it says, I have good intention, but I don't want to give them up yet. I don't want to give them up yet. That's dangerous. That's dangerous. Ask him to give you this fourth kind of a heart, which is what I would call as a fruitful heart. Fruitful heart. You don't want the hard heart. You don't want the shallow heart. You don't want the crowded heart. You want the fruitful heart. Verse 8. This is the seed that fell on good soil. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty or thirty times what was sown. Ideal condition, that's the good soil. Ideal condition for the seed to flourish and thus accomplish its goal. What's the goal? To produce good yield. Typically a five-fold yield was considered bountiful. But here, this is a super yield. I think the picture that Jesus is talking about is what he can do with human lives. He can take something that's, that the world looks at and says, you know, there's no hope there for you. You're so broken, there's no hope for you. Jesus takes lives that are like that and just transforms them in ways that beyond anyone can even imagine. And that's the yield pictures there. Look at what I can do with your life if you give yourself completely to me. Spiritual truth points to verse 23. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it because they want to understand it. Because saying, Jesus, speak, I want to listen, I want to yield. They have a teachable heart. They have a humble heart. They recognize they're sinners. They recognize they need a savior. They recognize, and Jesus is that savior. He is that king. They hear the word, humbly accept it, and allow it to flourish in their hearts. And guess what? It flourishes even among, even during hard conditions. Meaning this heart is there for the long haul. Not like that soil, that rocky places, when trouble or persecution comes, gone. This is not that kind of a heart. It's willing to pay the price for obeying Jesus. Luke, the other gospel writer in his version, tells us the importance of the long haul. Stay in Matthew, go to the right, page 1608, uh, Luke chapter 8, verse 15. Page 1608, Luke chapter 8, verse 15. If you can't find it, just listen to me as I'm reading along. But the seed, Jesus says, that's on good soil, stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and then here it comes, by persevering, produce a crop. Do you see that phrase? By persevering, they produce. Which means, even under harsh climate conditions, they still bear fruit. Sometimes we see trees that are 100 plus years old. 100 plus years old. Recently, uh, Gita and I had uh, gone to Stratford and uh, taken a little break and we were walking along the, uh, one of the uh, river paths there and uh, it was filled with beautiful trees. And one of the guys, I guess he's, uh, um, he's a geologist or something, he said he came and explained to us about some of the trees and one tree was like 150 years old or something, he said, just beautiful. It's a tree that perseveres through harsh conditions. Jesus says, the kind of heart that I give you is a heart that will persevere. Because the Holy Spirit works through those hearts. You see, the Holy Spirit does not bear fruit in a vacuum. He uses means. That's our perseverance. But he also is the one that gives us the strength to persevere. That's the kind of heart Jesus gives to us. Fruit production, just because we have a new heart doesn't mean fruit production comes naturally. God uses means, but he also empowers means. He does it through our persevering obedience to Jesus' commands. Is this the kind of heart you have? If so, there will be clear evidence. You say, yes, I have a fruitful heart. And there will be evidence. Evidence is what the Bible calls as fruit. See, the good soil, how do you know it was good soil? Because it bore fruit. Same way, if you say your heart is a good heart, a fruitful heart, then there must be fruit. 
What does fruit mean? Fruit in spiritual terms basically means a godly life. That's what fruit means, godly life. Godly attitudes on the inside, godly actions flowing from that on the outside. Godly character resulting in godly conduct. A life that is not only pleasing to God, but is also blessing to others. Think with me for a moment. When a tree bears fruit, is it for its own benefit? You don't see a branch you know, reaching out and pulling a fruit and eating. That's comical. That tree bears fruit for others, for the benefit of others. We bear fruit for two reasons. Vertical always first. We bring glory to God so people will see this Jesus changes lives. I want this Jesus. I praise him for changing lives. And second, it's to be a blessing to others. I mean, a lot of people running around taking plastic fruit and sticking it, saying I bear fruit. Imagine if a tree that bears fruit sticks plastic fruit. That's how many pretend to live lives today. Not authentic fruit, but plastic. They realize, they don't realize, I'm here to bring praise to God and be a blessing to others. They reverse it. I'm here for me. Joy, we've said this in the past, joy. J for Jesus, O for others, Y for you. We twist it. Me first. Me first. In a me first generation, Jesus says, no, me last. Me last. The Bible clearly teaches fruit is not only really required from a changed person, that's, that means the one with a good heart, but it will also be evident in them. You don't need to turn to it, but earlier, in two passages, this is already addressed. In Matthew 3, 7, John the Baptist says, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. That talks about fruit required. And then Matthew 7, 17, Jesus talks about every good tree bears good fruit. That's fruit evident. Every good tree, no exceptions. Every good tree bears good fruit. Now, the amount of fruit varies. Like you see there, 30, 60, 100. Amount varies. The more obedient we are, the more we will bear fruit. The less obedient we are, the less we bear fruit, even though we have the capacity to bear more. This is not about comparing with others. It's about God gives us certain abilities. You can produce this much. The more we obey, we'll get closer to that. The less we obey, the farther away we are from that, even though we have the capacity to bear more fruit. And that kind of fruit comes only by persevering. Faith without good works, faith without fruit is useless faith. True faith, new heart, is a fruitful heart. It's a persevering heart. It's unlike the hard heart that rejects the message. It's unlike the shallow heart that gives up when there is a cost. It's unlike the crowded heart that has competing interests. A fruitful heart sets Jesus' interest above everything. Above everything. And you get this kind of a heart. This kind of heart only when you accept the kingdom message and thereby King Jesus into your heart by faith. And what is the kingdom message? Jesus the king died for sins, rose again. And Jesus is the king who offers his forgiveness to us. By faith, we are to turn from our sins and accept this message, thereby accepting him. And Jesus is the king who will one day bring God's kingdom in all its glory to earth and everyone who wants to be in that kingdom should submit to his authority and live by his rules. You want to be in that kingdom. And you're saying, Jesus, you're my king. I am willing to submit to your rules, to your authority. To your rules, to your authority. And as a result, get this new heart. It's a fruitful heart that will bear much fruit. And you know, when we, often we think about fruit, we think about good deeds, but we forget there's one important thing that the Bible calls as fruit. It relates to the area of evangelism. Paul in Romans 1.13 talks about converts as fruit. Ideas, 
Part of the Christian life is to share about Jesus with others. Share about Jesus with others. A word of encouragement for, for us as we go out evangelizing. Remember, as long as we're preaching the gospel, we're bearing fruit. As long as we're preaching the gospel, we're bearing fruit. Results are not in our hands. Here's the greatest preacher who walked on earth. And when you look at it, only one of the four soils responded. The idea is not that 25% will be saved when we preach the gospel. I wish that was. That's better than what we actually face in reality. The idea is we will face more rejection than acceptance. But we must not give up. As long as we're preaching the gospel, we don't need to alter it. Remember, it's the same seed. The problem was not with the seed. The problem was with the heart condition. And only God can work in hearts. Our responsibility, faithfully proclaim this gospel. It's good news. Turn to King Jesus and embrace what he did on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins by faith. Turn and trust. Repent and believe. That's what we keep on telling people. Now, we've been talking about bearing fruit, bearing fruit and so forth. Before I conclude, let me also encourage us to understand we cannot bear fruit on our own. Kind of alluded to that earlier. We cannot do it with our own strength. And you know what? God does not call us to do it with our strength. We must rely on God alone to produce this fruit in our lives. I'm going to uh, take us on Old Testament passage and then a New Testament one as we get ready to close. You can follow along with me in your Bibles or uh, you can just follow along with me as I speak these words. The first one is Hosea chapter 14 and verse 8. It's kind of in the middle of the Bible then you got to turn to the right. If you're in Matthew, go about, it's actually about 12 books or so to the left, 11 or 12 books. Let me give you the page number here in a minute. Hosea chapter 14, chapter 14, page 1416 in the church Bible, page 1416 in the church Bible. It's very important for us to understand that we're not called to bear fruit with our own strength. It's impossible. It's impossible. Hosea 14 verse 8, the last part. You know, Ephraim was the tribe that came from one of Joseph's son, the second son. And God said, he's going to be bountiful, fruitful. And God gives this promise later on. And if you walk with me, if you turn and walk with me, what is what God tells? Your fruitfulness comes from me or will come from me. Your fruitfulness. What God is telling his people is this. If you turn to me and trust me, you're going to bear much fruit. But that fruit will come through me. I am the one that will cause you to flourish. We can plant the seed, we can pour water, we can cultivate. Ultimately, it's God who gives the increase. Not only in terms of evangelism, church growth, but also in terms of overall fruit from our labors. Your fruitfulness comes from me. Jesus elaborates this, and I know where you're thinking. The passage I'm going to go to is what? John 15. That remarkable passage where Jesus comforts his distraught disciples on the night of his uh, betrayal and death in John chapter 15. Let me give you the page number again. Page 1676. Page 1676. Jesus, let's pick it up from verse 4. Remain in me. Stay attached to me. Be in union with me. Stay closely connected with me. Remain in me, as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. He's already talking to disciples who are already saved. So he's telling them, it's not just that you get saved, but you all have to be closely connected to me. It's so clear. You cannot bear fruit by yourself. You must remain in the vine. Same way, he uses that again. It's a metaphor of a tree, either the branch and the vine, and applies that to our life. You cannot bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Again, he explains. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Again, think 30, 60, 100 fold, you'll bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing, period. Oh, you might do some good works, but that's not 
for God's praise and for eternal value. They'll get burnt up. Get burnt up. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned, which means no bearing fruit that goes to the second soil and third soil there. Contrast, maybe the third chokes it unfruitful, refers to unbelievers. Jesus is going to contrast by fruit bearing. Not only is it required, it will also be evident. But remain in me. Stay attached to me. Allow me to work in you and through you. And then verse 8, he says, ultimately, the fruit bearing is for what? This is to my Father's glory. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. You want to know if you're a true Christian? Here you go. That's what Jesus says. This is to my Father's glory, number one, that you bear much fruit, but also you will have genuine assurance you are my disciples. And that's important. Not false assurance, genuine assurance. So let's cling to Jesus, who through his Holy Spirit will enable us, empower us to be more fruitful as we persevere in obedience to his commands. You know, in the, uh, at the beginning of the sermon, I mentioned the title of the sermon is Know Your Own Heart. I also said each of us should examine ourselves and even better ask the Holy Spirit to examine our lives to see which ground our heart resembles. Again, if you don't have a heart that resembles this last heart, the last one that's acceptable to Jesus, the fruitful heart, you don't have that kind of a heart. It doesn't matter which of the three kinds you have. They basically talk about an unbelieving heart. And believing heart is pictured in three categories for us. That's all. At the end of the day, it's only two hearts, believing and believing. If you don't have the kind of the heart that the fourth one is a fruitful heart, you need a brand new heart. A brand new. And only Jesus can give you that heart. He is in the business of giving new hearts. That's the joy. Jesus specializes in taking messed up lives. The key is for us to acknowledge, I am messed up. No ego needed here. I am messed up. Give me a new heart, Jesus. Ask him from where you are today. And whatever doubts you have, fears you have, give all that to him. Come to Jesus with all your doubts, with all your sins, with all your fears, with all your baggages. Come to him in faith, pleading for mercy, asking him for a new heart. And I'm telling you this, he will give you a new heart and he will help you live this life that he calls you to live. And if you already have that kind of a heart, continue to remain attached. Continue to keep clinging to him. Doesn't matter how much you messed up. Every day can be a new beginning. That's the promise of the gospel. Every day. This Sunday can be a new beginning in your life. This Lord's Day, November the 22nd, can be a brand new beginning in your life. Bear fruit for God's glory and for the benefit of others and also for your own soul's assurance that you indeed are a child of God. Father, we are thankful for this word that you've given to us through your spirit. I acknowledge even this message cannot bear fruit unless, Lord Jesus, you through your spirit work in the hearts of everyone here. So overrule my weaknesses, overrule the wrong things I might have said in this sermon, the confusing things if there were any, and just do the work that you alone can do. My word that goes out will accomplish the purpose for which it is sent out. That's what you've said. Let it accomplish the purpose of salvation, Lord. Salvation. Again, for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.